And I think that teachers think that the best way of seeing a child's ability is to do a test. When I was five, I used to be terrified of going to school because the teachers used to shout at me because I cried and I missed my mum. I don't work well under pressure and I don't do my best in tests. There's now a so-called nursery place for every four-year-old, but for most, that place is in a school reception class. Critics say for many young children, learning is too formal too soon. Three children. Jordan's my eldest, and he's gone to school at four. And although he's done well, my friends who've had children similar ages haven't done well at all. For a lot of them, it's taken them to year one for them to settle in properly into the school system. Johanna and Paul Lawrence live in Cambridge. Like all parents, they worry about their children's education. Their four-year-old daughter, Remy, spent last year at college's nursery school just around the corner. She's too old to stay there now, but there is a place for her in the reception class at her brother's school. The Lawrences like the school, but they don't want Remy to go there yet. When Jordan was four, it really was a case of just going with the flow and, and following the norm. We weren't made aware of options open to us. And so we did, at the time, what we thought was right. No, I don't want that for Remy. I don't want that. I think four is too young for her to go into the school system. We want the best possible start for our, our children. I'd like her to be able to play, to enjoy, to enjoy nature, to build on her personality, to respect others, you know, how to be a nice person for longer than she would do in a normal education system. I want her to be as stress-free and as happy for as long as she can. But is Johanna right to want play for Remy? And what price do our children pay if we get it wrong in the early years? Play is crucial to animals in terms of developing a whole variety of different skills. And we reckon it's important because there are quite heavy costs to the animal of playing. Uh, they can injure themselves, uh, they can be caught by predators, they, they can interfere with their mother's hunting in the case of these animals. So it, it, we, we reckon it's, it is very important and, and will have benefits in all sorts of different kinds of ways. Through play, these kittens are acquiring skills in dealing with each other. They're much less likely to hurt each other when they, they bite, much less likely to scratch each other when they claw each other. So they're learning to control their behaviour through play. And this, exactly the same thing is true for children. They seek out opportunities for play unless we force them to do something else. Play occurs at a particular stage in a child's development and if the child doesn't get that opportunity, it probably won't ever get it again. At College's Nursery in Cambridge, play is geared towards what are called desirable learning outcomes. How to get on with one another is as crucial a lesson for children as it is for animals such as chimpanzees. If you play as a child with other children, you learn to control your own aggression, you uh, learn to understand the aggression of others, you learn to cooperate. Because she hasn't got any. Could you break some off for her? She's there beside you, look. Learning to be with other children for some children is quite difficult because they may be in, uh, 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 have only been playing by themselves at home. It's also about children's self-esteem and feeling very confident and comfortable within the environment. And gradually, once they become comfortable, they will build relationships with other children and learn to do things together. Those aspects are absolutely vital before they're ready for more formal skills. What does she need to do to make it big? Zoe knows about that. What do you need to do, Zoe? 
Correct. You only have to throw your eye around the room to see that there are many exciting and interesting and um, alluring ways to spend your time in this nursery. The early years are a key time for learning physical skills. At the time when they play most, their nervous system and their muscles are developing very fast. And so there's a window in development when it really helps them to be very active. There's enormous benefits in terms of, of, of physical fitness. If you played a lot when you're a child, you're less likely to be obese when you're an adult. You can more easily pick up new physical skills when you're an adult. Children need to develop their gross motor skills as well as their fine motor skills and they need to develop those big muscles before they develop the fine muscles. And so um, there is lots, a lot of opportunity to play outdoors in the garden. I'm mixing up yellow. You're mixing up the yellow? And then there are opportunities indoors for fine motor control, drawing and puzzles, all sorts of small manipulative toys. Hands. Good. There's an eminent early years professor who says that children learn more about right and left and how to form their letters when they're on the climbing frame than they do with any amount of tracing letters on the sheet on the, at the table because it's understanding the relationship between the two halves of your body that teaches you the difference between left and right and it's being able to move your hands and body to the places where they have to be to get you over this ladder or along this, this obstacle course that teaches you how to move them when you come to do the fine, fine movements of writing. The children at colleges enjoy exploring how the world works. How do I? Right, oh, that's a good thing to say, isn't it? Right, here it comes. Many children are very, very interested in things that go round, and to see that something that goes round makes something go up and down as well is a combination of two of the things that children find most intriguing, and so the combination of them is absolutely irresistible for these young children. Remy is too old to stay at colleges, but the Lawrences want their youngest child to come next year. The nursery uses a learning system called High Scope, or Plan, Do and Review. I, I found you our, our nursery booklet. We believe that it's very important for parents to be as involved as possible in the nursery, and so parents are invited to bring their children in, and when we've greeted each other and children are ready, they have an opportunity to talk about what they're going to be doing. What are you going to do now, then? Good choice. And then the children can actually go off and do something that they have um, planned to do. And it could be anything really, indoors or outdoors. It could be by themselves, it could be with a friend. What would you like to do today? Play with Ryan. Play with Ryan. Well, Ryan's put his sticker over here near the climbing things. Are you going to climb too? Would you like to put your sticker near the climbing things? <coughs> In high scope, the aim is to help children take responsibility for their own learning. Do you know what it's called? Pineapple. A pineapple. It becomes much more fun for the, the child if it has played an active role in deciding what it wants to do. And if it's pleasurable, it'll continue into much more formal schooling. They'll have good relationships with their teachers. They'll, they'll go on doing it all the way through their, their schooling life. The chance is taken to explore early mathematical concepts. How many pieces of pineapple do we need? Um, five. Do you think? Shall we count the children and see? Yeah. Are you ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven pieces. Ooh. Although no formal numeracy or literacy teaching takes place, the children are surrounded by opportunities to play creatively and develop their language skills. This child who's getting stuck into a book isn't going to do very well if you assess her on some formal understanding of letter recognition or whether she knows what her full stop is for. But she knows what books can do for her as a person, as a literate human being. She knows that they've got stories in and characters and that she can manipulate those and recreate them for herself. And that's a more important thing to be able to do than to name the letters of the alphabet. At the end of the play session, there are carefully chosen adult-led group activities. 
I think this little lady has got a special job she wants you to do. Do you think you could make a swimming pool for your play person? Colleges gives the children so much. It's all there on offer. It, it's like being in a sweet shop. She can have everything she wants or just want one sweet. Being able to make choices, I think choice was a real good thing at, at colleges. It's important in the real world. It's teaching them real world skills. We have often had feedback from local schools saying that our children are confident and um, independent. Children need this kind of environment um, for longer than it's possible at the moment. Um, and I think that in, in schools, um, it's probably quite important that they look carefully at their curriculum to allow for the children to be having a freer play-based curriculum. There's a wonderful scene in uh, Mark Twain's Tom Sawyer in which Tom has misbehaved and he's being punished by his aunt and she's told him that he's got to whitewash a big fence in front of the house and he starts to work, very grumpy about it. I said, hi Tom. Oh, hello Ben. And then he notices his friends coming along uh, and so he pretends that he's enjoying it. And the, the friends uh, start to mock him because they think he's being punished but he pretends he's actually doing it for fun. And after a while, the friends start to give him gifts. I'll give you my cat. I'll give you this dead cat. Well, Tom, is it a deal? You may start on the other side now. I'll stay and watch this side dry as right. It ends up with all his friends painting the fence while Tom enjoys his presence and watches them doing it. Now, now the message behind this, which is very astute, which is that people will do things in play which they won't do if they're made to do it, or even if they're paid to do it. Work is what we have to do, and, uh, and play is what we choose to do. And it's that aspect of it which is so important and which we have to recognise when we watch our own children's develop. Oh, yeah, look, Montessori School. We took Paul and Johanna to visit the Downham Market Montessori School. Like college's nursery, it's been praised by government inspectors. As at colleges, there's a mixture of activities for four-year-olds, but the balance tends towards more formal learning. What time do they come in in the mornings? Um, well, they start their day officially at nine, but they can be dropped off from half past eight, and they have free choice. So they go to the shelves and they choose anything they want. When they have free choice, they will often go off and they will get a word box or they will get a, a, a game where words make sentences. They will choose to get alphabet letters out of the, uh, out of the box and match them to objects. Um, and they could choose at that particular time of the day to play in the sandpit or paint. So a lot of them, when given the choice, go and choose that sort of activity because they enjoy it. Yeah, well, what are you going to paint, Chloe? Remy's only four, so would she be in this class or would she be in um, reception? If they're a young four-year-old and they, we think they are ready for it, we will say to the parents, we think your child is academically, emotionally, socially ready to move on to reception. Um, we chat with the parents. If we're all in agreement, they move on to reception. If they've joined the school later or they aren't, they're a little bit shy or they're not so emotionally secure, and the parents will say, well, I don't think he or she is quite ready for reception yet. We say, well, fair enough, they can stay in the nursery because the curriculum is for under fives. So it doesn't matter whether that child is in the nursery or the reception, they're following the same curriculum anyway. What does Tigger like doing? Like that. He likes bouncing, doesn't he? <laughs> so to us, we just move the children from the nursery to the reception, regardless of age, when the child is ready for that transition emotionally, academically, everything else, so that they just move when they are ready for it and not because their birthday is a particular date. Oh, turn it round so the mouse is at the bottom. What's that one? Oh. That's right, B that makes a sound. Oh, well done. That's right. The things that we do here, all the um, more academic things, learning their letters, learning to read, learning number when they're under five, is done mostly through games which they find enjoyable, so it's learning which is fun. If you make it very rote 
and very boring, um, then you've lost them. Can I have your turn, Bradley? Well done. Oh, well done. What have we got here? L that makes the sound. This is literacy reduced to its smallest parts. This is disembedded literacy. This isn't about books or stories or poetry or drama. This is about the tiniest little building blocks of literacy. That's it. D that makes the sound D. D that makes the sound D. And? The most worrying characteristic of the most formal settings is the limited intellectual demand that the tasks make on children. If there's only one right answer, then you look very carefully at your teacher's face to pick up the clues to get the answer that will please her. Katie. These different theories about education go round and come round, but at what point do you say to the little boy who always prefers to kick a football round the sports field, now the time has come, you've got to actually start to learn now. Learning isn't something they start when they get into a schoolroom and pick up their rulers. They've been doing it very actively. I mean, we, we know what wonderful language users they are by three or four. That's not because someone said, hey, stop cooing in your crib, you've got to do some proper learning now. Living and learning are practically synonymous when you're a young child. It's no good providing the experiences and then putting them on the shelf and waiting till the, the timetable says, yes, now's the time for you to take up this interest. It may have evaporated by then. Um, this is reception that is different from nursery. It's like a bridge between the nursery and the year one and the rest of the school. Well, I was quite surprised that four to five year olds were doing maths worksheets that were like, you know, seven take away four. four. When you come into your class, what do you like doing best? Um, playing. Four. One, two, three. Um, and take six away. One, two, three, four, five, six. So there's only one left, isn't there? It's taking away playing. Yeah, but it isn't. It isn't playing. Isn't it? No. What is it? It's just it's take you're just taking numbers away because we take them away. Because Miss Smith says that it does. What would you like to be doing right now? I don't know. I must, I must be going home because I'm tired. Seven takeaways. Two. We all learnt some bits of our mathematics by rote, but it's not mathematical understanding. It's whether you want to learn to do something because your teacher tells you to, or whether you want to do something because you want to make sense of it and understand it. That's the difference. Seven, take away seven. So we're going to put seven on the mat and take seven away, aren't we? OK, you do that one then. There were some really good points to the Montessori school, definitely. Um, a very pleasant environment. I think if you're looking for that type of education for your child, I think it's a wonderful place to send them. But... It's, it focuses too much on education achievement. Although it may, may be achieved through play, there's still a lot of education in, you know, reading, writing. Okay. Dictation. Yeah. She wouldn't like to be boxed in like that. There's evidence that depriving young animals of play at the crucial time in their development has long-term consequences. Separating young rats overnight leads them to play vigorously when they're put back together. As far as long-term deprivation of play is concerned, if the rats don't get that play experience, then when they're adult, they're much less able to compete properly with, with other rats. Their whole social behaviour pattern is, is, is disrupted. For a few children, the pressure of a formal approach to learning is hard to cope with. It can lead their parents to take drastic action. Edward Field is now taught at home by his mum. The teachers told us that he was fine, but we felt something was wrong. He cried, he wouldn't eat, he was having nightmares. Um, he would become more and more, as you walk to school, he'd become more and more anxious the nearer the school gates you got, um, to the point that it was, please don't make me go. And also, when he came out of school, he was always very angry. And he'd always come over and hit me or, or be sort of aggressive. The worst thing that I remember was the teachers. Yes, I used to cry in the morning because I missed my mum. And um, she sent me 
out of the classroom a number of times to stop me from distracting the other kids. That's what she said. He was five at the time and they were giving them homework and it was just too long a day for them. Um, we consulted two psychologists and an educational consultant who in the end said he was more harm than good was being done to him at school and really that was all the information we needed to know. We just went and got him that day and he never went back. He wasn't happy, he wasn't settling and he'd gone from being a very sort of bright inquisitive child of four and a half to a child who was just totally turned off education completely. Well, we felt all through her early years education and to an extent her junior years, there was a pressure that for Becky made her quite a tense, agitated child. Not at school so much, but very much at home. And I think that we, we just knew that it wasn't feeding another element of her. And I went over to the Rudolf Steiner School in Kings Langley and saw what they had to offer. And I just knew and could feel that, 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 it was, that, that the education that was offered there was going to look at the whole child and look at the whole of Becky and feed other parts of her and nurture parts of her that she needed nurturing. I have a lot more freedom than I used to at school and time for myself to th think about what's happening in my life. Um, time to think about others and I think I've got more time for the things that I l like to do and I think that childhood is not a race it is not a race and I think there's a, so much pressure on get, on getting your four-year-old to behave or read or behave in a way that is inappropriate the Rudolf Steiner approach to education is the closest we come in this country to what happens in much of Europe. No formal learning takes place until the child is six. Good morning, Ella. Good morning, There's a Steiner kindergarten in Cambridge. We're giving them the space and the time to actually explore their environment, to breathe out into life. They live such an incredibly busy life. The stars twinkled. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. When we talk about play in Steiner education, what we're, dis what we're really talking about is creative free play. It's not a preconceived teacher's outcome based play. And where we step in as teachers is just to help a little bit and guide um, should it become a little bit difficult socially or something like that. If you think about children's learning as needing nourishing and feeding, then you can understand the role of the adult in being there to feed and extend and nourish it. When the children are in charge, everything that children do is driven by this burning thirst to understand the world and to make sense of it and to be part of it and to join in with it and the people who are playing around them. When the teacher runs the play, that possibility is lost. We quite often have children who actually come from reception and we find that when they come they're quite anxious and they feel as if they've got to stand and watch. They're waiting to be told, no, you can't do that or you must do this now. And uh, they keep waiting to be told what to do. You press it in. Two, two fingers. Difficult, isn't it? While they are playing, the teachers are involved in what we call meaningful activities. At the moment, the teachers are filling little shells with shoe polish because we're going to be polishing shoes today. So the children are able to help with this if they want to as well. Then, of course, the learning situation comes out of this. There's plenty of mathematics and literacy in these children's lives. You've only to see them sharing the bread and butter at around the table at snack time and counting the slices and so on to see that they understand that the world has mathematical meaning but it's it's woven into the fabric of the life they lead together they're actually using language an enormous amount and they're also learning a lot of dexterity um, we do a lot of drawing we do a lot of painting cutting sewing with real needles um, woodwork with real tools and it's these things actually that are giving them very fine motor skills and we actually find that when they do go into formal learning at around six 
they're actually able to, to pick it up very, very fast and catch up in an incredibly short time. We've chosen the Starner School, but it was an incredibly hard decision to make. Ideally, we, we would have wanted Remy to spend a year at the kindergarten um, and then enter the reception year, but that's not possible. What do you do with a child who's been to nursery and what do you do with her for that year before she goes to school, if you take a year out? I mean, she's at the Steiner School and it's brilliant, it's great, but the downside to that, or it could be, is she has to go to school at year one. The government's currently working on new early learning goals for what's being called the foundation stage. The debate is over what sort of experience children should have in the early years. How soon should play be put aside in favour of formal learning? We're in the middle of what I call a quiet revolution in the early years world, and you can't uh, create excellence overnight. I'd like to see different types of schools. Your, your, your formal school, um, schools like this, the Steiner, so that people have more of a choice. What we do want to do is raise the quality of the experience the child enjoys in whatever the setting. And what we know is that it is the quality of that early years experience which will determine the good outcome for the child later on. Children are very, very good at learning, so they'll learn more or less whatever we do to them. It's what happens to them as learners, what they learn about themselves as learners and what they learn about learning. If they learn that learning is boring, unstimulating, unrewarding, not worth the candle, that the teacher's there to tell you when you're right and wrong, some way down the line, they learn that it isn't worth going on with it. The early years of a child's life is about preparing a child to develop and work, uh, cope with key stage one. Now, if you get to the stage of nearly six, uh, I think early literacy and numeracy skills are totally appropriate. That's not overly ambitious for a child that is reaching the end of the foundation stage. I'd say to the government, look at other countries. Look at Scandinavia. They don't go to school until seven. They, 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 they end up just as well as, as our children do, probably rather better, actually, in all sorts of other ways. And so it isn't necessary to start so early. I know when the early learning goals were first published, they were subject to controversy. And I think the controversy was that they were, people understood them as being where we wanted children to be at three, not where we expected most children to be at the age of six. The foundation stage is not a curriculum, it's a framework. And the goals are goals, they're not tests. It's not about formal learning, but it is about play with a purpose. They are our future, our children. Let's not put too much pressure on them. It's too much, too much to say. Let them be children. Like doing like that. He likes bouncing, doesn't he? <laughs>